Andy, we were talking last segment. A successful season for Miles Brennan, and we just looked this up. Uh, obviously, Joe Burrow just set the LSU single uh, single season record with 60 touchdown passes. Before that, Jamarcus Russell had the record with 28 in 2006. He had tied hmm. Matt Malk, who'd thrown 28 in 2003. A successful season for Miles Brennan. We set the I set the over and under at 24 touchdown passes for Brennan this upcoming season. How many do you think that position can produce with a different player at LSU? Oh, well, a successful season is 15 and Ella Heisman Trophy in the National <laughs> Championship, don't you know? Yeah, it's the only, that makes sense. It's the only way. Well, it, it's funny because I remember a few years ago uh, after Baker Mayfield won the Heisman and Kyler Murray was going to be the, the, the new quarterback in Oklahoma, I spent the whole offseason with those guys. Don't put so much pressure on Kyler Murray. He's replacing a guy who had one of the best seasons a quarterback has ever had. So don't feel like if he doesn't, Quite match Baker Mayfield's stats, but it's not. And of course, he goes and blows him away. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know that I'm. I think I'm done assuming that that somebody you know replacing somebody in a, in a good offense is not going to be able to stack up. Although I would say I think with the season Burrow had, it's going to be pretty hard to match. But I, I don't know that there's a number you can put on it. I, I think if if you're in, I think you can go over thirty given the the receivers he has. And if they're running the same offense, which is is what it's supposed to be, you know, yeah. that that's the thing that I I find interesting about this is, yes, Joe Brady's gone, but Steve Insminger is still there, and Steve Insminger was the guy, you know, actually calling the plays. So I, I think there's a, a pretty good chance that schematically they're they're pretty similar, and then you look at what they have to throw to. Well, I mean, you could put up some big numbers in that offense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I think you should. I think the number that I landed on was like 35 for that over-under. We're talking to Andy Staples here on Off the Bench. Andy, um, I, I want to dive into Florida with you because they are maybe the most interesting SEC offseason storyline to me. I've been asking all of our kind of national guests about them. Um, who do you – when you look at the East, who should be the favorite? Should it be Florida or Georgia this season? It should still be Georgia. I mean, they've won it three years in a row. Mm. Their recruiting rankings say they they should be the top team in the East. Somebody's going to have to beat them before I, I'm going to say different. I mean, the thing about Florida right now is the circumstances of this season and and, and the way this year has gone. I think do favor Florida a little bit because they've had so much continuity. You know, got, their whole coaching staff is back, with the exception of their tight ends coach. Uh, so many key starters coming back. And you miss spring practice. Everybody misses spring practice. Well, they're the one that could afford to miss it the most. Yep. You know, they, they've got a bunch of guys that have played together for a long time. And even defensively, where they, they have to replace some key guys, a lot of the guys that are stepping into those roles have played fairly significant roles, either because somebody got hurt or just because they were trying to get them, get them snaps as young guys. So I think they've done a pretty good job developing. But the, the thing about Georgia is, you know, I, I remember being at that game last year and just thinking it, it doesn't feel that close, even though it actually was close. It yeah, was it did. One it. game in the fourth quarter, but it didn't feel that close because it, it felt like Georgia was more talented. Now that's where Florida has to has to close that gap, and you know we'll see if they can. I, I think the offensive line is a big deal for Florida, and you know they've got Seward Reese who came in as a as a grad transfer from Mississippi State. I would imagine he, he's got a spot somewhere in that line. And then they've got some guys that were redshirt freshmen or freshmen last year who came on at the end of the season, and it looks like they might be in, in line to, to win starting jobs. And if that position group upgrades, I think it, it does change things a bit uh, in terms of the dynamics for Florida. Because I think last year Florida had to go really pass-heavy because they just they couldn't block you know, in, in the run game all that well. And if they can have a more balanced offense, I do think they're going to be pretty tough to stop. The, the Georgia thing, Georgia's defense is going to be really good this year. We don't know about their offense yet. There's, you know, we'll see what Todd Duncan brings. You know, you got Jamie Newman coming in. I, I would think Jamie Newman's the starting quarterback. I know they, they got JT Daniels as well, but I don't know that, that he's going to be eligible necessarily. And, you know, 40 offensive linemen, but look at how they've recruited. I, I just feel like saying because. Jake Fromm and four offensive linemen are gone. Georgia's not going to be as good. I, I don't think that does a service to, to the talent they have on the roster. Hmm. 
Okay, Andy Stables. Okay, that's fair. Guys, that's what I was going to go next to Georgia, but instead I'll go here. Uh, when I was looking at the schedules the other day, they talked about the NBA Finals could be October 12th weekend, right? And I wanted to see what else is that weekend, give an idea of just what a crazy amount of sports will have going on at once. And that weekend, it's going to be LSU and Florida in the swamp. And then I'm like, okay, well, I want to look at where they'll both be. There's a very good chance that they'll both be 5-0 and at that time. Florida, by that time, I think would have three SEC wins under its belt. If you're looking at two undefeateds going in a swamp on that day, is that a top five matchup? Like, Do you think both of them will be in the top oh, five yeah. at the time? I, I think so, especially given given what they'll have played. You know, I, I, people are looking at Florida's schedule and saying, "Oh, you know, other than LSU and, and Georgia, this thing's a walk." I don't think that's necessarily true. You know, Kentucky came to Gainesville two years ago and beat them. Yep. They barely squeaked by Kentucky and Lexington last year, and this will be a better Kentucky team than last year's. And I think Tennessee's going to be a different team than the one they played in Gainesville last year. Okay. So, if Florida can get to the, get to LSU undefeated. I think that that's a pretty good sign for the Gators. I, I think that would be a very big, probably the biggest home game at Florida in a long, long time. And you know, I, I definitely think if both teams are undefeated, you're, you're talking both of them in the top five. If you're looking for really good insight on the University of Florida, there is a uh, good sit down with Andy Staples and Dan Mullen on the last Andy Staples Show, which is a podcast that you can find wherever you download your Apple podcast you can also find andy on twitter at andy underscore staples he covers college football for the athletic andy what have you made over the last couple of weeks of uh of dabo sweeney you know it's one of those things where i think dabo may have, may have cracked the code on some of this stuff because you you get people saying well why hasn't he said anything why hasn't he said anything and then he just you know releases this kind of long you know here here's everything i've been thinking but he doesn't react immediately to every little thing on social media, which I think that's probably a better better PR strategy. And I know there's some people who are never going to be happy with, with the way he handles things, but you listen to his explanation of everything yesterday, and you can understand where he's coming from. Now, I have a question about, you know, is, is Danny Pierman going to be able to recruit from this point on? But, you know, you, you look at what happened, you look at Dabo's explanation, you look at uh, the player who was involved has explained himself very thoroughly. You know, everybody's told the story and, and corroborated it. So I think I, I understand where they're coming from. I still don't know if he's going to be able to recruit from here on out. So that, that's something that they're going to have to figure out. Is Kirk Ferenc in hot water? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We'll find out. It, it certainly seems like they, uh, I don't know, ignored is probably the wrong word. Didn't recognize that the way they were running the program probably is not conducive to, to I'm trying to think the right word, to, the right way to say this, because I almost wonder, would Iowa have been better had they been running it in a way that was a little friendly to some players? Because it, it, it feels like there's a, you know they they've got a group of players who feel like their voices weren't heard who feel like you know, they they were not treated the right way and and I'm not even getting the the Daryl the Daryl Johnson Cleonis thing last night we don't know if any of that's all true or what in that is true you know if, if those accusations were all true it's a very different story but that's one of those you, you got to wait and see if all that's true. Yeah. But you look at the way that black players from Iowa have responded to how they were treated and, and, and the story they told over the last few days. The fact that they didn't notice this, that this didn't, didn't register, I don't know. It, it, it seems weird. And I do think if you look at how most of the guys, other than, than Kuliana, John Scalianos, They've all got Kirk Ferentz's back. They all seem to want the strength coach gone. So huh. my guess is the strength coach, Chris Doyle, highest paid strength coach in the country, maybe he doesn't come back off suspension and Ferentz says, well, I'm going to run things a little bit differently from now on. Hmm. I would think that's the more logical outcome unless there's something else. One of the great writers in our business. You can read all of his work over at The Athletic. He covers college football over there, and he's got a great podcast, The Andy Staples 
show that you can download over at The Athletic and get it where you subscribe to your Apple podcast. Uh, we always appreciate the time. Thank you for the insight this morning. All right, thanks, guys. You got it. There he is. Thanks for checking in this morning.